I'm ready, right? Okay, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, your invitation. So the uh, title of my talk today is Assessing Lifetime Cancer Associated with po uh, Population Exposure to Particles with PM, Particulate Matter Bound, PAHs, or Polyaromatic Hydrocarbons, and Carcinogenic Metals in uh, three mid latitude metropolitan cities. Before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my students, my doctoral students, Mohammed al Hill and uh, Vahid Farahani, who is now Dr. Farahani, who just finished his PhD, and he's working for the California Resources Board. And our paper uh, was submitted uh, about a month ago to Atmosphere and just waiting to, to receive the reviews. So, um, how do I advance? Excuse me, I'm pressing the arrow, but it doesn't move. Um, I doesn't, why am I not be able to move? Yeah, I'm pressing the arrow down, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look like it's moving. The mouse, so, but yeah, I don't see the cursor either. Uh, I mean, I see the cursor when I move it by by hand, um, unless there is some other way to advance the slides. And, okay, now I got it. I'm not sure what I yeah. For, okay, sorry about that. So the objectives of our uh, work was to uh, to assess the uh, lifetime cancer risk linked to exposure to particulate matter in uh, three metropolitan areas, uh, sharing the same uh, geomorphology and climate, a uh, mild Mediterranean climate, namely Los Angeles, which is my uh, one of my hometowns where I work, Milan, which is neither my hometown nor a place that I work, but I love it, this is a city, that I, <laughs> my favorite town in the world, and Thessaloniki, which is a town that I was born and raised in Greece. Um, what these cities have in common is they're, they're large metropolitan areas, so you know what I would call the first world, um, they have exactly the same geomorphology, the same uh, mild Mediterranean climate, but they're characterized by distinctly different pollution sources and, uh, of course, air quality regulations. For example, the air quality that is uh, Los Angeles has had in the last 15 years very strict air quality regulations, whereas neither Milan nor Thessaloniki did. And we're going to see how all of that affects uh, the results and the outcomes of our work. So the whole idea of the study was to see how these different pollution levels in these three cities with similar morphology and climate and characteristics, how they um, differ so far as uh, affecting the overall cancer risk by inhaling particulate matter. And of course, the, the emphasis was on outdoor pollution, uh, not on, so ignored, not deliberately, but ignored indoor sources because these are difficult to control. I mean, in other words, outdoor pollution, you know, whatever comes inside, it's something that everybody breathes. Indoor pollution depends on individual habits. I mean, someone is a smoker, someone is not a smoker, somebody cooks a lot at home, somebody doesn't cook at all. So that's very, very difficult to, to assess. So the idea was to focus on, your, on outdoor um, air quality, which is, after all, the only air that is regulated anyway. Somehow there is no regulation that I know of when it comes to indoor sources. So let's start with Los Angeles first. That's the uh, largest now uh, metropolitan area of the United States. In the last couple of years is larger than New York. It's a population of 18 million people. It has a very nice uh, mild Mediterranean climate. Um, it's surrounded by um, three sides to the north and east by very high mountains, the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Um, and to the west, there is a Pacific Ocean. And most of the, uh, the prevailing wind is from the southwest to the northeast. So it takes all of the emissions of the city moves them uh, eastward. There is a lot of, there is therefore a lot of accumulation of air pollutants in the basin. Um, the um, RPM or particulate matter is mainly products of vehicular emissions and the oxidation in the atmosphere, especially during the long summertime periods that we have, uh, they're called secondary formation, the oxidation of these uh, products of vehicular emissions, especially in the summer. And what is really interesting here is that uh, as of, not since of 2007, we have had very, very strict state and federal regulations affecting uh, uh, our traffic emissions, especially heavy duty trucks. And um, these uh, resulted in remarkable reductions in uh, vehicular emissions overall. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later on. Milan, uh, it's uh, to me, one of the most beautiful cities ever. It's the real capital of Italy, uh, not Rome. It's, it's so far as business and uh, financial, it's uh, the real heart of, uh, the industrial world, of the industrial Italian uh, world. 
This is a similar Mediterranean climate. It's also surrounded by very high mountains, the Alps. Um, it has uh, similar to Los Angeles, oops, excuse me. Similar to Los Angeles, we have traffic emissions and the oxidation of these emissions are called secondary organic aerosols in the summer. And uh, unlike Los Angeles, we have intense biomass burning, so a lot of wood smoke in the winter. That is a major source of residential heating in, in that city. We don't have that in Los Angeles. And uh, that's uh, what I wanted to talk about. Milan and Thessaloniki, like I said, is my hometown where I grew up in Greece, is the second uh, most populous city of Greece. And it's actually considered one of the most polluted cities of Europe. We are every year in violation of uh, air quality or WHO, WHO standards. Uh, so it's really a, um, the, the air in Thessaloniki is not a, uh, the air quality is actually quite terrible sometimes, both in the winter and the summer, particularly in the winter because there is a lot of uh, uh, uncontrollable residential wood burning that, um, especially the financial crisis of 2009 and thereafter, has been uh, one of the major sources of uh, residential heating. So people sometimes in the suburbs, especially, they just burn whatever they can get their hands on. And that, that has a terrible impact on the overall air quality of the summer. So these are some you know, natural uh, sort of background information. These are our three sampling campaigns uh, in LA, Milan, and Italy, and in Thessaloniki. These are the publications of my group that describe in a little more detail the um, observations and the chemical characteristics uh, of particular matter during these campaigns. Um, some were conducted in 2018, some were conducted a little earlier in Thessaloniki, but that's, if someone needs some more information about uh, these studies, I mean, I would be more than happy to forward this paper. So that's this basically where all of this chemical data that I'm going to discuss today, they come from. So how they cal how we calculated um, a lifetime cancer risk uh, attributable to uh, Ventilation of particular matter. We focused on two groups of uh, particular matter species on trace elements and metals, and in the next slide on PAHs, so polyamide microcarbons. So for metals, uh, we followed the uh, methodology that uh, EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, um, prescribes, which is we multiply the concentration of every metal by the um, what we call the inhalation unit risk, which is basically the upper bound of the excess lifetime cancer risk associated with exposure to one microgram per cubic meter of that metal. Let me just jump ahead very quickly, and I'm going to go back to that slide. So where this data comes from, so this is the known carcinogenic trace elements and metals, arsenic, cadmium, chromium-6, nickel, lead, and forget about the PAH, that's PAHs. And this is the lifetime risk associated with every one microgram per cubic meter breathing that metal through your lifetime. So we multiplied that unit uh, with 0.8%, um, 0.2% of the outdoor concentration and 0.8% of the indoor concentration. I'm going to show you the next slide how calculated. We assume that basically people spend 20% of their time outdoors and 80% of their time indoors, which is a, you know, frankly, very reasonable assumption. Now, by indoor concentration, I mean the indoor concentration of outdoor origin. So no other indoor sources because we have no means of knowing with the millions of people who live in a given area, what kind of indoor habits they have. Some smoke, like I said before, some do not smoke, some cook, some have pets and kids running around. So this is only strictly speaking for outdoor. So the indoor concentration was the outdoor concentration of that species multiplied by this uh, IF factor, the infiltration factor. This infiltration factor is in three different scenarios. The worst case scenario, which is basically 80% of outdoor pollution getting in. Best case scenario, which is 40%, and an intermediate case of uh, 60%. So that's where this uh, concentration here came from. So that was for trace elements and metals. For PAHs, or polyamide hydrocarbons, we followed a slightly different approach, which is also an approach recommended by EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S. We basically used benzopyrene, which is the uh, most potent PAH, is used as a reference, uh, as a proxy for to represent, you know, the fraction of the complex PAH mixture. So every PAH of the ones that you see right here that we measured is we use a scaling factor to multiply its concentration. You use one for benzopyrene because that's the most potent PAH, and then every other PAH that you see here is multiplied by this potent equivalency. Uh, factor, which is 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and so forth. So 
we measure the concentrations of these PAHs, that what CI for a given PAH. We multiply that concentration with the potency equivalent factor that I showed you in this next table. All of that is basically, it's not our invention, it's basically how the EPA in the US calculates drift. And we calculate what we call the benzopyrin equivalent concentration. And that gives us an estimate of lifetime lung cancer risk as a result of inhalation of PAHs. And again, these are the values that we got from EPA and uh, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or, or HIA, of, uh, Cal of the California Resources uh, Board. Now, jumping into some of our data, this is the concentrations <coughs> excuse me, of some uh, carcinogenic trace elements of metals, namely arsenic, cadmium, chromium, nickel, and lead. In green are the data in Milan, in blue the data of Thessaloniki, and yellow the data of Los Angeles. And one of the things that becomes eminent, uh, prominent in these uh, two graphs is, with maybe the exception of chromium, the very, very low levels of LA compared to the other cities. And that's because, as I said before, we had um, uh, very stringent air quality uh, regulation measures in California in the last 15 years that seem to have uh, reduced substantially the concentrations of both PAHs and trace elements and metals in LA, which is something you actually do not see in Milan or Thessaloniki. There is a lot of, mainly there is a lot of combustion, especially residential uh, heating combustion in these areas that seems to be uh, contributing quite a lot to uh, the concentration of the carcinogenic species, unlike LA. The only thing that is hard to control in Los Angeles and somewhat comparable to Thessaloniki, although lower than Milan, is chromium-6. And that's because chromium-6 has many, many sources. It doesn't necessarily come from traffic, wood smoke. It comes from many, many smaller industries, uh, uh, minor, you know, plating facilities. That these are very, very difficult to, to control. You know, so that's, uh, and you see that you know these levels of chrome are quite substantial in LA. When it comes to uh, this is a busy table, but I'm just going to get maybe to the bottom of it and then show you perhaps the major conclusions of this table. These are all of the concentrations of polyaromatic hydrocarbons in the three cities. Uh, for some reason, because of my water here, Milan is a little chopped up. But uh, the, the sort of the key point here is that if you look at all of these levels, and by BDL is below detection level, it's basically concentrations that are, that are so low that we cannot even detect. Um, the concentrations in uh, Milan and Thessaloniki were probably 25 to 30 times higher than the concentrations of Los Angeles. Again, you can see here the levels, the total PAHs versus the total PAHs of Los Angeles. Again, as a result of these very strict uh, policies and mitigation strategies that we had in California compared to these uh, other cities. And this is uh, the total uh, carcinogenic equivalent of benzopyrene equivalent in the three different cities. Um, I wonder if I can move this, I can, so that you can see uh, LA. Because if you, if you do, um, can I zoom out? How can I do that? Because these are, if you can really see this number here, and I apologize, but this number is 0.2, which is actually 10 and 15 times lower than in Los Angeles, than in Thessaloniki and Milan. And these are some other uh, levels in other parts of the world. And also these are the, uh, the benzopyrene equivalent concentrations inside Los Angeles freeways, assuming that someone spent his entire life inside a freeway and what this uh, uh, equivalent uh, uh, cancer risk would be uh, if that person you know, lived in that, in that area. Oops. For some reason, once again, okay. Yeah, I, I don't understand why this is okay. Okay, and this is the, the total cancer risk, but just summing up the polyaromatic uh, arom uh, cancer, hydrocarbon concentration cancer risk, as well as the metal risks in this uh, table for LA, Thessaloniki, and Milan. These are uh, the worst case scenario. We assume that outdoor air infiltrates 80% indoors. The best case scenario would outdoor air infiltrates 40% inside. And the mixed scenario, which is about 6%. Just to give you an idea where these numbers come from. These are actually numbers that came from our study and the studies of many, many other people um, the last maybe 20 years. Um, the worst case scenario with the infiltration factor is 80% is basically when you have either your windows or doors wide open and or you have a relatively low house that there is a role of penetration of outdoor air inside. Best case scenario is a brand new home or a brand new building, very tight, you know, very good you know, uh, ventilation and filtration system. 
that you know removes a lot of this outer pollution, and the mixer and I are somewhere in between. And uh, excuse me. And this is the uh, overall uh, cancer risk multiplied by 10 to the minus six. So this number here, for example, assumes means implies that there is three. Sorry about that. There is three people or two people or 2.7 people out of a million that will get cancer as a result of breathing that air in Los Angeles. There is uh, likewise, let me see if I can remove this. There is about, I don't know if you can read this number here, 15 people out of a million who will develop cancer in Milan by breathing this uh, air or six and a half people out of a million who will develop cancer throughout their lifetime by breathing this air. If you ask me, is this a big number or a small number? Usually the recommendation of uh, most regulatory agencies, including EPA, is that what is acceptable risk is one in a million. There, if any time you exceed that number, that means that the overall risk of developing cancer in that metropolitan area is unacceptable, and the air quality authority has an obligation to go and do something about it, to tackle the air pollution sources. Now, if you ask me, perhaps, you know, philosophically, that seems a little too tight. I mean, one in a million, come on, give me a break. I mean, that's, that seems, you know, awfully strict. That's strict when it comes to one particular carcinogen. If you think that we have thousands of carcinogens in the air, then if for each one of them, the risk is one in a million, and you multiply the 10,000 carcinogens, then we have 1% or 2% or 3%. And if this risk is below, is above this one in a million value, then you have actually a very substantial percent uh, of people developing cancer as a result of uh, inhalation of this species. So the bottom line here is that LA seems to be much, much lower than Milan or uh, Thessaloniki, so about half to a third of the risk in Los Angeles and maybe one fifth to what was in Milan, again, as a result of these uh, regulatory measures that limited you know, combustion products uh, in the city of Los Angeles compared to these other two cities that uh, don't have similar measures. And the only thing that seems to be actually raising the risk in Los Angeles is exposure to chromium. That, as I said before, it's a very difficult species in the air to tackle. It's not, it doesn't come from cars and trucks necessarily. It doesn't come from uh, biomass uh, combustion. So it comes from many, many small industrial facilities. And that's where we need to work a little more to get a better handle on, this, uh, uh, on these uh, sources. So um, I'm just going to jump ahead because I'm not really telling you anything uh, uh, brand new here in this slide. This is most of the things I already talked about. So to conclude, um, we had Milan and Thessaloniki have been um, substantially higher than one in a million uh, probabilities of developing cancer uh, by breathing the air, uh, outdoor air in the cities, whereas Los Angeles was closer to the acceptable level of EPA. And we attribute, again, the lower levels of Los Angeles to the very effective air quality measures that were taken by state and federal agencies in the US compared to the other two countries that basically so far, as far as I know, there's no measures at all. So this is just some of the references that I cite, and I just wanted to thank you very much for your attention. I'll be more than happy to answer to your questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes, the uh, period was uh, there was one. It was one year, one calendar year. Uh, it was uh, uh, for the Salonikos 2015, and for Milan and uh, and uh, Los Angeles were 2018. Mm -hmm. It's actually outdoor but exposure. Yes, yes, we, we, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, but that happens in all three cities. I mean, these inversions that you're speaking of, yeah. they happen in Los Angeles as well as in Salonique as well as in Milan. Yes. Yes. Yes, we actually have a publication in 2020 that demonstrates. PM25. Of course. Yeah, Look, yeah rain, rain, absolutely. But but again, indoor air pollution is very, very difficult to control and regulate because it's, yeah, it's, it depends on the, yeah. And it's a, it's a function of individual exposure. I mean, so I'll give you an example. You spoke of radar. So I'm, I'll give you even a similar example. Smoking. Somebody smokes, somebody doesn't smoke. I mean, that's that, you know. You have a question, then then I'll go ahead. Excuse me. The pollution. Mainly, mainly lung cancer. Almost 100% lung cancer. Now, there is, uh, there is also some other types like lymphomas, but you know the vast majority of cancers attributable to air pollution is lung cancer. Which, excuse me, which, which makes it very difficult to decouple it from for, for cigarette smoke because cigarette smoking also causes lung cancer. So it's very difficult to follow smokers and examine the effect of air pollution on smokers because you know what what they do makes it impossible to evaluate the effect of pollution. Yeah, of course. Actually, I didn't hear the last part of the call. Can you, can you No, uh, uh, no, not really. Have I mean for lithium batteries? I no, uh, because uh, when it comes to air quality, I mean there is very the data attributable to lithium are actually very very low. So it's it's kind of hard to measure it. And, and the vast majority of um, species. 
unrelated to combustion fuel, maybe related to combustion, related to combustion for cars and stuff, and, and the risk associated with them is chromium. That's the only thing that actually strikes out as a very important species to control. You're welcome. Yes. We will. Yeah. There are, but well, it's more, more stable. Yeah. Well, uh, it, well, to some extent, even the other series are in the sense that when you look at, for example, animal data, not a, a specific month or a week, but you look at 52 weeks, uh, you know, our experience, I mean, in fact, for Thessaloniki, we compared our own study with the data, the chemical data of 2013 and another table 2019. So all of that before COVID-19, because as um, this lady pointed out, you know, COVID had a different effect on air quality. I mean, uh, at least at the beginning, sort of in many, many areas brought down all of the levels because of the restrictions. And now you look at three different years and the, the percent, the relative difference between chemical species is on the order of 20%, nothing much. And again, remember that if we want to talk about cancer risk, this is an, this is a, a very approximate estimate. You know, this is not so the uncertainties around these numbers are could be even 50%, right? But so they but they give you an idea. I mean, it's one thing saying that in LA, one person in a million will develop cancer breathing that air. And in Milan, 15 people, I mean, one in 15, these are quite different numbers, even with all of the uncertainties taken in consideration. Right? In Thessaloniki, seven people out of a million. So again, these are very, very qualitative data. Uh, overall, if you think about it, not just when it comes to quality, when it comes to any environmental science, water, food, uh, the cancer risk assessment is very approximate. I mean, even when it comes to smokers, you know, not, not everybody dies of lung cancer because they smoke. Not everybody uh, develops liver cancer because they drink, you know, like Keith Richards, you know, the Rolling Stones, okay? So, um, so, so that's... Uh, it's a very, very approximate, you know, uh, calculation. But, but it gives you an idea whether an area is doing well or an area is not doing well. Like I said, the, the key point here is that LA, as a result of, you know, the, the regulations, is doing much, much better than these other two European cities. That was sort of the key point of the study. And three cities that otherwise share exactly the same morphology and climate. I mean, it's another thing, it's one thing comparing Copenhagen or Stockholm with, you know, Mexico City because in one area because of the weather, of course they're gonna have very, very different source of pollution than another. So that's it. All right. Thank you.